Invest Africa, proudly brought to you by KPMG. Hello and welcome to Invest Africa. I'm Nozi Pombandra. Now, the World Economic Forum on Africa is over for another year and more than a thousand delegates who attended, shared and debated the big conversations that will shape Africa's future now have the opportunity to reflect on the key outcomes of the meeting that was held in the city of Kigali. In this episode of Invest Africa, we'll be bringing you some of the prominent voices from Kigali and we start off with a reflection uh, by catching up with Anna Easton. She is a sustainable business director at the BT Group and she joins us now from London. Anna, thank you so much for making the time to join us. You were in Kigali, you were part of uh, the meetings of the World Economic Forum on Africa. What were the big conversations that resonated with you this year? Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it was really, really exciting to be at the World Economic Forum this year in Kigali. Um, what was most exciting for me was actually hearing the loud message over the three days that ICT is the critical enabler not only for transforming the African economy, but also for underpinning every single one of the sustainable development goals. So there was a really balanced conversation between the economic and commercial interests in the region, but also everything that we need to do to actually transform the lives of the millions and billions of African people. And oftentimes, of course, Anna, these conversations uh, will take place amongst politicians, amongst business leaders, and there's always the criticism that not much change happens and not much action happens after the meetings. Did you get a sense that there was a stronger resolve to act on some of the commitments and the declarations made at this year's meeting? Absolutely, yes I did. I think what was really exciting about this meeting was the fact that we also had a number of working sessions. So in Davos in January, the World Economic Forum had announced an Internet for All initiative, which is actually about helping the four billion people across the world who don't have internet access to come online. And what we agreed and we announced in Kigali was that we will be running a live project in the Northern Corridor of Africa to help 25 million people get online by 2019. Um, to put that into context, there's about 112 million people living in that geography. 75 million today don't have access to the internet. Mm -hmm. So that's a really, really ambitious target. And the only way that we can deliver that is to continue the conversation outside the room. So in fact, the first meeting of the African ministers, of the, the African ICT ministers of those countries, and the private sector organizations that are involved will be in June. We'll all be getting together in London at BT Center to actually design a program for making that happen. Mm. So it certainly sounds, Anna, that there's a, a lot of work that is scheduled to happen after this. But let's talk a little bit about the BT Group and uh, the, your interests on the African continent. In particular, you're one of the world's leaders when it comes to the ICT space. How do you see ICT transforming development in Africa? Well, we've, um, we have two sort of roles in Africa. Our first is our commercial interest because many of our biggest customers have aggressive expansion plans into Africa. And we've been investing in assets and services and talent to make sure that we can support them as they grow. So as they grow, we grow. And from a development perspective, we've had really interesting learnings over the last three years. Three years ago, we launched our Connecting Africa initiative, which is now live in 30 villages across 13 countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we implemented satellite broadband connectivity into the villages, and with the connectivity live and up and running, we can now overlay healthcare management systems and also education services to the women and children and families that live in those villages. So we have seen the transformative effect that ICT and broadband access can have on the sustainable development goals. Certainly, uh, infrastructure comes to mind and uh, the government's uh, investment into infrastructure becomes very important. What has that experience been like? Because even though you've achieved uh, these massive connections uh, across multiple markets in Africa, surely there must have been some challenges with the infrastructure. There are infrastructure is still a massive challenge in Africa and one of our objectives in the Northern Corridor is to see how we can accelerate access. 
The governments in those countries have broadband plans in place, they're already developed. The challenge is to implement them and then really, really focus on the last mile, on those remote rural African communities that are still going to be left behind if we don't do something differently to help. And that's going to require other sources of funding. It's going to require government funding. And one of the things that we'll be focusing on is working with policy leaders and government ministers to see how we can collectively unlock that investment to close that infrastructure gap, particularly in the last 5%. Mm. What is your assessment of the political will, uh, Anna? Because to a large, ex large extent, uh, to see this integration coming through will depend on uh, government leaders coming together and willingly opening up their borders for this integration to take place. Is there the will on the ground? That, that what was what was so exciting about the World Economic Forum in Kigali this year, because we had the ICT, ICT ministers there from Kenya, from Rwanda, from South Africa, from all over the continent, actually talking together and working. And in the Northern Corridor, we have commitment from every single country ICT minister to work together in collaboration to look at what we can do from a regulatory perspective, from a policy perspective, and also potentially working with us on network sharing agreements to really drive down the price. Because of course, affordability is also a massive challenge in that geography. But it was really exciting to see the caliber and the seniority and the commitment and passionate and drive from those ICT ministers at the World Economic Forum. And that gives me confidence that we will succeed. Mm. As one of the investors uh, into the African continent on the back of ICT, uh, which, which are some of the risk variables that you would like to see addressed that would improve the commercial case for investment for a player like the BT Group? One of the um, critical risks and one of the biggest areas that we need to think about is actually power. Um, power is still a massive challenge um, across the continent and it absolutely needs to be addressed before we can roll out any kind of ICT infrastructure. So we will need to be looking at that in conjunction with our ICT plans. Well, uh, Anna, thank you so much for making the time to join us. Anna Easton from the BT Group and, of course, one of the delegates that has attended the World Economic Forum on Africa. Now, Sub-Saharan Africa in coming years is expected to register slower growth in the face of low commodity prices and drought in some countries. David Lipton, who's the first Deputy Managing Director at the International Monetary Fund, caught up with CNBC Africa in Kigali, Rwanda, and he shared his insights on how the region can mitigate the present economic shocks. Well, the world's been uh, a difficult uh, setting for African economies because of the adverse events in the global economy, but I think it's fair that most countries in Africa are still rising, others are regrouping and will be rising. So we, we talk about these multiple shocks, obviously the fallout in commodity prices, yeah. we also talk about tighter financing conditions globally, and then of course you do have the drought that is impacting a number of economies. Which of those three elements do you think is the most challenging? Well, bad things come in threes, and I think it's been a tough time for some countries in Africa. About half of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa are experiencing much lower growth than they did before these events. I think the, the most, I mean, the, the drought may be very acute for some countries, but the biggest event has been that the global economy has slowed, and with that, uh, oil and commodity prices are way down. And what that's meant is that a lot of countries have diminished export revenues and diminished government revenues. That's likely to... Uh, continue for a long time, so they really need to adjust. Now, we do talk about this infrastructure deficit that uh, obviously impacts the African continent substantially. In the tighter financing condition environment globally, it's very difficult to attract long-term capital uh, mm -hmm. with the current risk scenario. A lot of the discussions here at the World Economic Forum in Kigali will be about de-risking Africa to attract alternative financing solutions. Do you think that uh, we are on the cusp of being able to deploy capital on a wide scale across the continent to address infrastructure deficits? Well, I think we're seeing that capital markets are going to get pickier and they will differentiate among countries. There are still frontier markets that can attract capital. Um, and foreign direct investment continues to go to places where the investors feel comfortable. But you're right, there will be countries that have quite a hard time. I think maintaining and even boosting infrastructure spending is key to the future growth of Africa. So countries need to do 
the best they can. Some countries will have to do it themselves. They'll have to boost their own uh, resource base, what we call domestic revenue mobilization, save more, uh, find ways to boost uh, tax revenues to make sure that they can build a modern infrastructure that will create a basis for uh, sustained rapid growth. In terms of collaborative finance, financing models, if you look at development finance institutions, the private sector, public sector players, uh, are we seeing multi-stakeholder financing solutions coming to the table or do you think that we're still some way off? It's happening, it's beginning to happen and people are putting an awful lot of energy to the financial engineering of how to make this happen. But it does come after a period where uh, the banking sector problems in the US and Europe have led regulators to be more cautious uh, with the kind of capital requirements we now see. Banks are less interested themselves in doing project finance. We've seen what you've referred to de-risking of banks pulling back from some of their correspondent banking relations. But in, the, in that place, there are new sources of finance that are being uh, uh, devised and new players coming in. Uh, I think it's, uh, the opportunities are so great. I expect this to be successful, but it will require some uh, evolution. So David, you make the comment that uh, capital flows where capital is welcome. There are a number of frontier markets competing for that capital. Does Africa st stand a chance when it, when it comes to other frontier markets, given uh, sometimes skepticism over policy stability in a number of the countries across the African continent? Well, it is a new market. You know, frontier means new, and I think it is a new, this is a new region for a lot of investors. But there's a tremendous amount of excitement. We see it here in Kigali at the World Economic Forum. There are a lot of people here who are here for one and only one reason, which is to uh, figure out uh, where to invest and how to do it uh, profitably. So I'm optimistic. But uh, surely um, countries will have to show that they have uh, a strong foundation, that they're welcoming, and that uh, people who come in uh, uh, stand a good chance of uh, executing their projects. Having been on the ground for a short period of time, what would you say is the number one challenge that we, we face as the African continent, if we can group the 54 individual countries together? It's hard to really, uh, it's hard to uh, generalize because some countries really are going to be in uh, adjustment mode. Um, but I think that uh, the countries that are still growing need, to, the, the biggest challenge is to sustain it. This is a marathon, it's not a sprint. This is a region that has a lot of marathon winners. Uh, they know how to win a marathon, and that is that when uh, uh, you reach a hill, you have to uh, change your stride a little, but then power forward, which means countries need to make sure they're cautious, prioritize their uh, fiscal spending to make sure they're still supporting infrastructure, health, and education, not run up uh, debts in a dangerous way, uh, maintain some uh, important room for maneuver and, and margin of error. And then just a final question, as you say, Africa needs to continue to power ahead, but it has to do that without the turbo boost of China. Yeah. Do you think that that is going to be a key talking element here at the World Economic Forum on Africa? I'm sure there'll be a lot of interest in what's going on in China. China's slowing, but it's not disappearing. So China's still going to be buying an awful lot of uh, imports, and a lot of that will come from this region. But it won't be the kind of driving engine of growth that it's been. So countries here need to boost their own demand. They need to diversify. Uh, in this region where we're sitting, they need to integrate. Uh, Kigali, uh, Rwanda is a small country, 11 million people, but the East African region has 200 million. That's a big market if it's integrated, if it's uh, connected and brought together. So there are things that can be done to uh, uh, provide for some more homegrown growth. That was David Lipton, the first Deputy Managing Director of the IMF, speaking to us about how African economies can survive this economic slump. Let's take a short break, but when we come back, we bring you more big voices from the World Economic Forum on Africa meeting that just wrapped up in Kigali, Rwanda.
Welcome back to Invest Africa. We're bringing you the big voices and the conversations from this year's World Economic Forum on Africa, which has just wrapped up in Kigali, Rwanda. Now, one of the focus areas, of course, has been the strategies to support Africa's digital revolution. CNBC Africa caught up with Oscar Onyema, who's the chief executive of the Nigerian Stock Exchange, and he believes that integrating capital markets is a step in the right direction. Well, as you know, um, in South Africa, for example, the markets are very deep and liquid. Uh, they have many listed companies, so there's always going to be activity. Mm -hmm. um, Nigeria is not as deep as liquid uh, and liquid, but um, there are so many listed companies as well. Right. So there's always activity uh, going on. So I think the core of uh, an exchange business is, is, is listings. Um, and with listings comes uh, trading and uh, value-added services and products and the rest of it. And right. so you begin to see a lot of activity. Right. But it takes time to build a listing business. It's very difficult. So with time, uh, I believe that uh, the East African markets uh, will get there as well. All right, now uh, let's talk about developments. It's, uh, we've been waiting for integrations of the market and automated trading. You did that a while back. Just, uh, but with that, of course, a lot of revenue, a lot of listings coming on, but it also comes in with a lot of work to get into the stock exchange. Just tell us what we should be on the lookout for. Um, uh, you know, with, uh, the theme of this conference is, uh, uh, is, is around the fourth uh, industrial revolution, which is the whole idea about using the cloud and the Internet of Things and the rest of it. So technology is beginning to compress time and is beginning to facilitate the ability to reach out to a lot more people that we can reach. So I believe that uh, with improvements in technology, um, it's only a question of time. You will see um, the utilization of that technology in the capital markets. We're already seeing it elsewhere, um, where uh, it's not only about just matching your trades uh, or clearing, but now even accessing uh, uh, potential retail investors and institutional investors around the world, mm -hmm. providing data to allow them to make investment decisions that are informed, um, and then beginning to do interesting things like back office, uh, uh, which is where the work is really back exactly. office, yeah. but using new technologies like blockchain uh, and, and the rest of it. So um, it, it will get there. Uh, Rwanda has taken the lead in so many ways. I'm quite impressed with what I'm seeing here uh, in the country. Um, around the use of ICT to drive development. And so we think that uh, it has some legs and it can be utilized across multiple platforms. Uh, uh, and certainly this is true for the capital markets. All right, through 2015, 2016, we've only seen one listing, uh, and which was here in Rwanda, uh, argue the youngest market in the region, so which came as a surprise for the entire region. But is this a similar scenario that you've experienced before with you? Okay, on the uh, Nigerian side of things, uh, it's been difficult because um, the market is currently going through a downturn. And typically, uh, in downturns, you don't see a lot of IPOs. Uh, you, we might see a few listings by introduction. Um, the, 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 uh, when the, primary, mar uh, when the so uh, uh, primary market softens, the secondary market tends to follow. Then what you will see as conditions improve is uh, rights issues, secondary issues, and stuff like that before you start seeing IPOs again. Mm -hmm. um, so we're certainly seeing uh, a reduction in the number of listings uh, this year. Um, but with that said, uh, the expectations uh, that across the continent, uh, from a pan-African perspective, uh, that uh, African uh, markets will which, which still do relatively well with regards to capital raising, mm -hmm. uh, although it is nuanced, so it's not going to be uh, evenly spread, you know, it's going to be a few markets right. are still doing very well. All right, now sector by sector, uh, we we'll wind up with this. The agriculture sector, first of all, has uh, is now largely pegging on the capital market development and revenue from that. But how sustainable is this? Well, uh, to be honest, uh, because uh, African agriculture is still largely subsistence farming, uh, we haven't seen the kind of um, scale of listings from the agricultural space that you would expect because most of our economies uh, have large uh, sectorial balances from agriculture. Mm. Um, but I, I, and another thing, we, uh, a lot of the economies are now beginning to move away from 
uh, farming, not that they're moving away, but they're beginning to add value-added services. Right. So processing, packaging, and the rest of it. Um, and that is where we see the value. Uh, and that is where potentially you will see company, companies that are big enough uh, to come to the market. And that was Oscar Onyema, the CEO of the Nigerian Stock Exchange. Now, as the World Economic Forum on Africa meeting wrapped up, we caught up with Josephit Muwara, who is the Managing Director of KPMG in East Africa, and we got his reflections on this East African showcase. I think first of all, I think for everybody coming to the continent, for us as uh, African citizens, we need to appreciate that tax is a given. If we want to realize development, if we want good roads, if we want education, if you want health, you have to pay your taxes. The question is actually one of translating the tax that you pay into value, into results, and that there is limited if none uh, leakage between the revenue and the results that you see on the ground. That's, you know, that, that's, a, that, that's one side of the story. So every single one of us have to understand and, and, and um, the governments around the continent have realized, you know, the, the objective now should, should be to make it easier for individuals and organizations to voluntarily comply with tax requirements. Easier said than done. Um, no, no, it's not easier said than done. If you if you accept, if you look at iTax, if you look at uh, the 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 what I call the net platforms that are being created, it's a matter of our understanding as as citizens that this is the way I am supposed to uh, access this system. This is the information I'm supposed to create. That's, so that's the one side we need to accept that and we need to comply. The other side of the story is is the incentive story, that. If you are complying and then you set out to create a small business or you set out to be a large investor in that market, the first priority um, for our African governments should not be to increase the amount of taxes that you pay. Uh, their first priority should be for those governments to facilitate your entry into the market, to facilitate the rapid growth of your business, to facilitate the rapid expansion of wealth, to facilitate the rapid expansion of, of employment and, 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 and your market. And when you, are, then when you achieve those, then they can come back and say, hang on, look at all of this that you have achieved in the space that we have created. How much of that is coming into uh, our domestic revenue. Uh, but when you change the order, uh, then you, you, you become an inhibitor uh, to wealth creation, to employment creation. And quite honestly, that's really where, you know, because if, if, if as an organization, as KPMG, I'm coming in, I'm employing uh, young people. Uh, I'm coming in, I'm helping businesses uh, to grow. Uh, I'm coming in, I'm creating wealth. Um, and, and, and eventually contributing to paying uh, taxes. These first three are the ones that you really want to be focusing on because that's where if people can then uh, provide for themselves more, um, then your, your demand for services reduces and then you have this more of a public-private partnership. All right, uh, let's now bundle up uh, as we finish our conversation. The mm -hmm. African Union commitment to set up the continental free trade area by 2017, yes. coupled with the road to one Africa marketplace, it's been a very bumpy road given uh, uh, different policy regulations uh, from different economies. What is your view on how achievable these projections are? Um, this is very simple for me. Uh, Africa either uh, develops together all we decline together. It's very simple. If you look at the case of Rwanda, and Rwanda is an, you know, an example of exemplary transformation, but there are limits to what that transformation can achieve with the size of the country, with the limited size of the population, and therefore the limited size of the market, um, and, 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 and also its location. So Rwanda doesn't have any alternative but to cooperate with Tanzania, with Rwanda, uh, sorry, with Burundi, with Uganda, with Kenya, uh, and, and with Congo, because you, you are part of an ecosystem. So integration, uh, again, is another imperative.
Uh, now, the challenge that we have is that we all want to swim in our own small ponds and keep everybody else out uh, because of these very temporary borders that were created in 1886. Um, so if you're looking at, for example, infrastructure and, and, uh, and the African Union has got a very clear plan for investing in infrastructure, the case for many of those infrastructure projects can only be made if you're serving a region, not a specific country. Uh, when you're looking at the scale of, of, of investments um, in production, again, the case can only be made if you're serving the 300 million or thereabouts uh, when you include Ethiopia um, uh, and the Sudans um, in, in the region. That becomes a sizable market, um, which you know, compares with the West African market where Nigeria is the big, is the big brother. Um, so for me, and the approach is, is, I, I see is twofold. You have what I call regional clusters which need to come together, which need to plan their development together, which need to invest uh, in infrastructure together, uh, but with an eye on interconnectedness between those clusters. So if you're looking at um, Southern Africa and Eastern Africa, Southern Africa are working together to invest together, East Africa are working together, but there is an interconnectedness that once that comes together, then you can connect the two. And eventually, when East Africa and the Maghreb join up, you can actually move from Cape to Cairo um, uh, seamlessly. This, uh, but, but, uh, and for me, it's a question also of leadership. Um, if, if, because you will have opposition, there are people already in these markets who are making a killing out of these closed markets. And out of the uh, confusion and chaos. And, uh, exactly. And so it, it's, it's in their interest to keep those markets closed because once you open up, you introduce a level of competition that they cannot keep up with. And that's where we leave it for today. Thank you so much for joining us on Invest Africa. Don't miss the show next week where we bring you the conversations from Africa Utility Week and we bring you an interview with the CEO of ESCOM in South Africa. Do stay tuned and look out for that next week. Goodbye.